So welcome back friends. We have a big problem today. We are in the midst of a massive ice storm. This area in particular, for some reason, about every two or three years, uh, gets a, um, these crazy ice storms. It's, it's not snow, it's, it's not what typically what you see anywhere else. I don't know if it's the, just the relationship to the Pacific Ocean and the Cascade Range, but what happens is the weather drops down to about 24, 28 degrees or so, and then it starts raining, and everything gets covered with this bulletproof layer of ice from all the tree branches, the power lines, the roads. Right now, it's raining on me, but as we're looking around, we're starting to build up on the ground here. I can see a half inch, half inches of solid ice. It shuts down everything with that. Unless you have ice chains or some really capable vehicles, you can't even go anywhere. The schools are shut down. All of the local businesses are shut down. So I wanted to share with you uh, a hack that I came up with years ago that will help you to be like a superhero <laughs> on ice because you still need to get around and falling down on the ice is, is uh, man, it can be really, really dangerous. You can get really, really hurt. So there's still jobs that need to be done here in the homestead. I'm going back and forth and I came out today and I almost wiped out. So I'm going to take you in the shop and show you my ice cleat, rubber, my boot ice cleat hack. I want to show you just how bad it is. This is the driveway and maybe you can see there, I can focus on there everything is covered by a half inch of ice and what makes it bad this is the worst possible driving conditions in the entire world because it freezes hard because the ground is cold and it's raining and now you have a layer of water on the top it's absolutely treacherous and it continues to to melt and to build up and build up and you you're just stuck you can't go anywhere with it i'm going to demonstrate just how how difficult it is just to tr just just to try to walk up a a, a slope, <laughs> you can see, it. <laughs> uh, with r just normal like rub rubber boots on. That's that's how that's that's how, how slippery it is. Let's go fix that. <laughs> All right, are you ready for the hack? It's simple. You need twelve of these little screws right here. These quarter inch. They take a regular screw, the little machine screw, little panel screws, I forget the, the name of them, but you have to have this one. You can get these at any hardware store. It's a, it'll, it's a quarter inch socket will fit it or a flat baited screwdriver. Now that's the important part right there. You don't want to overlook. You can get them like this one right here. That's not the right one. I don't know how that slipped in there, but you want the ones that have the little flat slot for the screwdriver because they... They have a little ridge around the outside of them and they've got more surface area and those little those little ridges in that portion that sticks up proud, it really, really bites. So you want 12 of these and the configuration is really, really important too. And this, I've tried all different ways of doing it and this is what seems to work best. You're gonna put two up front, right? Two up front towards the toe. Now look at your shoes, look at some shoes maybe that you have that are, that that have been worn down that you've worn for some time and kind of take a look and see where are the wear marks on them. You know, if you pronate or do different things or have a bit of a different gait, you can use that to kind of adjust it. And the heavy wear areas, that's where you want to put your these screws in here for the best traction. Um, and that way you're not putting in some place portion of the shoe where you don't put any weight. So that will help you. So you want four up front, two on the front right there. That's where you, when you're, you're bending your toe in where you're getting your, your grip, that's where you start the, the, the start your, uh, your foot, your, your, uh, your tread. And then you, as you rock back here, you'll put two here on the outsides, right about the ball of your foot is a good spot. Now over here on the back side, then you take the, the remaining ones and you do two on the heel back here on the outsides. Now that will help you your feet from coming out from underneath of you when you're slipping uh, or when you're going downhill. It wouldn't even be a bad idea to put a third one right there. I just haven't found it necessary. Six screws, 12 total, six in each boot is perfect. Now don't go inside the house with these. You'll uh, you tread on your uh, wife's new wooden floor, and you won't. She won't be happy. So I recommend doing this to a boot that is a slip-on type of a boot, like these these hateful muck <laughs> muck boots or UGG boots or whatever they call these things. They're fine boots. They're really handy. They're they're waterproof and they're super popular with uh, with people that live in the country. And I understand that's why I use them. I just don't care for the fit. I, I don't like a boot that flops around. You know, the fireman boot style of 
it, I, I like a good fitting boot, but it's such a drag to undo all the laces and all that. So something like this, you can do this to your Romeos or whatever. They'll last about two seasons. Um, and if one falls out, you screw one in, not a big deal. Uh, and you can take them out really simple for the summertime. These seem to last, um, last really good. So that's the configuration. Let's take it outside and see how it goes. Are you ready to see the difference? All right, check it out. Same ice. Uphill, downhill. Downhill is a little, be careful. You want to make sure you uh, keep those knees bent and remain those the cat like reflexes. But, uh, but you can get around with the cleats in this configuration really well, no problem. And it's just a lot safer. It's just this easy fix and it just works, works so good. Now, it, even over here, I'll, I'll sh even everywhere you step, you can see where it's just cleaning up the ice. And usually these will last about, for me, last about two winters or so. The screws will fall out or something, but it's easy, it's easy fix, of course. I forgot to mention the length you want, just get the half inches, just the little ones. That way you don't have to worry about them coming up into the shank or poking you in the foot. They're, most boots should have plenty of rubber that half inch will suit you well. So let's, uh, let's put the wooden shoes on and see if there's any truth in that. I'm not sure what the Dutch know about ice. I don't think it snows there, does it? These are my official Dutch wooden shoes. I was shocked when I went there and I saw guys that were working in the uh, windmills wearing these things. Did you know in, in uh, some countries they're, they're considered a safety shoe? Like a, like a steel toe shoe would be in, uh, in America? So let's see, so if the, if the Dutch happen to find themselves in a, in a Pacific Northwest ice storm, would they be able to get around? I'd say the verdict is still out as to whether these are ever going to gain traction and popularity in the, in the States. I kind of doubt it. M Mrs. W tried to talk me into wearing them home on the airport and I just <laughs> couldn't. I couldn't do it. <laughs> I couldn't do it. All right. So already they feel kind of sticky. All right. So let, let's see here. See if we can do this without wipe, wiping out here. Now you guys are in luck. You just don't get content like this on, yeah, on any other channel on YouTube. This is a first here. Okay. So they're surprisingly sticky. They, oh, they actually work. They're sticky. Um, they're soaking in some water. They're getting wet, but they're... They really do work. They, I wouldn't. I don't know that they're as good as the, as the uh, studded snow boots, but they're not bad. <laughs> That's amazing, huh? Maybe we need wooden tires. Wooden tires. I don't know how well that would go over. Hey, let me show you the Hucka Polita's. The what? The best snow tires, winter tires in the world. Uh, if you're buying them uh, or uh, for your vehicle, I would highly, highly recommend them. Everyone around here has been running them. It's almost like cheating. You don't, it almost gives you, a, gives you a false sense of security when you're on icy roads because you just don't know it. Perfect example. So the van is two-wheel drive. Um, uh, Brian and I were heading down to firefighting training, uh, and he's got a four-wheel drive Toyota that just had kind of an aggressive mud tire on it. He went around a corner and lost the whole rear end and spun out and, and he was in four wheel drive uh, and I was uh, right, I saw him behind me. I was right in front of him and I just railed right through there. I didn't even know it was slippery running these Hucka Politas. So uh, let me show them to you. These are the winter tires you want if you have a light truck. These are Nokian, Nokian is the company. Hucka Polita, these are LT. So I'm running on this on the van a 225-75R16. This is a 10-ply tire here. So if you have a, anything that's three-quarter ton or one ton, uh, that's the tire you're going to want. They make them different models for passenger cars and all of that. But it has a rubber compound that is incredible. I get the studded ones. And the nice thing about it is, you know, I've had studs done at, at local companies here where they just stud the tires. And they use a, just as a as a or interesting side note, if you want studs that last a long, long time, the only state I think is legal to run hardened steel studs is Alaska. So we ha I have some 
of course, I wouldn't do this myself, but <laughs> it's highly, highly illegal. But I do know some guys locally here that order the studs from Alaska tire dealers, have them sent down here, the blanks, and then have them installed uh, in their tires, and they last a lot, lot longer. But the nice thing about the Huckapolita studs is, is they have, they're, they're almost like pins that come up. And when they put these in, they put them in, in the factory and they balance the tire with them. So they're a very, it's a premium tire, a really high end quality tire that balances well, and they're a lot less noisy. They don't stick up so far as some of the other ones, and they wear better because they, the diameter of the stud is the same for quite a ways up. So as the tire wears down, you still get that sharpness rather than on, you know, some studs, they're kind of shaped like a pyramid. And then after one or two seasons, they, they're basically flat round metal discs on there and they actually make traction worse. So these are incredible, incredible tires. Um, probably the best you're going to get the, they just, uh, well, of course the, uh, where are they made? What did I say? The fins? The Finns wouldn't know anything about driving in cold weather, would they? All right, thanks for watching, and we'll see you guys on the next video. I don't know what it is about adverse weather, but I, I always I always enjoy it. So I, I've got a lot of positive response from you guys who uh, have enjoyed me bringing back kind of uh, little conversations in the end cards. I guess it's like kind of a bonus. You get a little mini podcast as well as a, vi <laughs> as a video. But I wanted to share something with you. This is a story um, that I got firsthand uh, from, a, from an acquaintance of mine uh, years ago. I've told it before, but it's been some time, but it... Um, uh, the reason why I'm sharing with you today because uh, I experienced it in real life um, myself yesterday. So this guy uh, that was a friend of mine, so he was a big high-powered real estate agent, really successful. And he was uh, working from his home and he was getting ready to show a very wealthy, a guy that was a multimillionaire, uh, him a piece of vacation property. It was like a ranch uh, up in northern Montana. And so this, uh, this millionaire had flown in from some city and drove all the way up to my friend's house um, to jump into his car and, and to go see this, um, this huge ranch. Well, uh, my friend is a uh, devout Christian and uh, kind of a, a lay minister. His wife was a stay-at-home mother. They raised their kids from home, and he ran his real estate business. So this guy came over, and they jumped in front of his truck, and he, they were getting ready to head out. This was a really a big deal. It would have been a, a tremendous commission for him. Well, he started his truck and he looked out the front window and saw all of the laundry hanging on a clothesline that his wife had put up and it was, had been up there and it was ready to come down. And he, uh, he told me, he said, the Holy, the Holy Ghost spoke to me and said, Jim, I want you to take that laundry down, put it in the basket and, and take it in and give it to your wife. And he had this tremendous struggle within, you know, of course, you know, we as men and especially those of us who are, are breadwinners was thinking, are you joking? That's not, not my job. Why would I, uh, I've got this important man sitting in my truck. Why would I do this? And uh, uh, why would I make him wait and, and go and do this meaningless or, or, or this insignificant task? You know, I'm, that's where pride comes in, right? I'm, I'm too important to, to do such things. That's, that's my wife's work. You know, that's, that's what he was telling me. I mean, that was the first thing that came into his mind. He said the Holy, said the Holy Ghost, he really pressed on him. He was like, Jim, I want you to do this. So Jim turned the ignition off got out and started putting the clothing in the basket, taking it off one piece at a time. And here this important guy sitting in, in the cab of his truck watching this. So Jim does this, walks in, you know, takes, takes a couple minutes, takes the laundry, puts it in the house, gets back in the truck. Of course, the guy turns and looks at him and says, what, what are you doing? Why, why, why did you just, just do that? And, uh, <laughs> He said, "He goes, I, you know, I, I didn't know what to say. I was, I was really conflicted, and so I, I just, I just decided to tell him the truth. I said, uh, well, God, God told me to. Well, this guy came unglued. He was had want, wanted nothing to do with Christianity, um, and was very offended, and just laid into Jim at the time, you know. And Jim was really wondering if he had done the, if he had done the right thing." So anyway, so they they went and through, through Jim didn't think anything of it. The conversation never came up again. The guy actually said, "Don't ever talk about Christianity to, to me again. I'm not interested in it. I don't want it." And Jim just said, "Okay, that's fine." Um, but the funny the the point of it is is that years later, the same man that uh, was in the car that uh, was so anti was so so against hearing anything about Christianity called Jim on the phone in the middle of the night. It was maybe five or six years later. 
and said, Jim, I want you to pray for my family. My, I'm having, my, my wife just had a, a boy, a little boy, and he's dying in the hospital. And because of this, um, that one act that Jim had performed um, with the clothesline, um, that this man ultimately accepted Christ in his life. So, you know, the interesting thing about it is, is had Jim, he had a real struggle with that decision. And had he um, not, not done that, had he thought that he had, would, would have been too important and pushed the urging of God aside and not perform that simple ta- task, which he didn't understand at the time, it may have been that this man had, would, would never have been saved. But, it, it, you know, God knew that this would make an impression on him, and God knew what was going to come down, down the road, and, and that this was a tool that he used um, to reach this, this wealthy man. Oh, it was just it was an incredible, incredible story. Um, oh, I'm going long. Should I tell you my, my, my side of it? I'll tell you what. I'll do it on the next video. I don't want this video to go too much longer. But I had a similar experience um, as Jim, my friend Jim, did. Um, that I'll share with you next time. So, all right. Well, I hope you guys have a good day. It's uh, Sabbath is coming. It's Friday. Friday, what time is it here? One o'clock. It's uh, the only thing that I can, uh, uh, one thing that I always want to encourage you to do is is whatever day you take, uh, take a day a week off. And we always talk about it, but to make it special. And our family's getting ready. It's always such a, it's always so nice on Fridays. Mrs. W is in cooking and preparing the food and always does a nice meal and and Jack looks forward to it and knows that there won't be any chores, and it's a, just a wonderful thing. So I encourage you to do that. And uh, if you're religious or not, it doesn't make any difference. Just, just take a day off and, uh, and, and do it. It'll be a blessing for you. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you guys on the next video.